yes, it's, it's great to be here at the first event of Sarah's new lab. Um, Sarah and I have worked together for a few years now on various projects um, and I think over that time we've, we've sparked off a few interesting ideas and approaches. Um, so it's really great that I could be here to talk about design sociology. And I must admit that I'm really cribbing from design anthropology with my design sociology concept because design anthropology has been around for quite a while and Sarah and others here in this room have been major contributors to design anthropology. And um, as someone who is mostly trained in sociology, I have got a bit of anthropological background training as well, but mostly sociology and identifies as a sociologist, but also moves between media and communication studies a lot as well. Um, when I started reading up on what design anthropology people are doing, it did strike me as, well, that's interesting, why don't we have something called design sociology? Because we don't, you know, I googled it, design sociology, nothing, really. Um, and yet, design anthropology is a well-known and often used term and has been now for, for quite a few years now and there's been some really interesting, particularly edited collections around design anthropology where people have been uh, showing how anthropological methods can be used uh, in relation to des design context. So that really got me thinking, well, why is it that we don't really talk about design sociology? Um, and it's because sociologists just haven't really got with the program, you know, we haven't really cottoned on to what the possibilities might be to incorporate a design research method approach to our research and the kinds of topics that we're interested in researching. There are of course many of us who do do a lot of research into um, uh, uh, sort of digital technologies, devices, um, software and, and digital data. Um, and that is called uh, digital sociology often, which is also something I've been writing quite a lot about and I have a book called that. Um, so as someone who has been doing quite a lot of research in digital sociology and engaging with people like Sarah around design-based methods, I, it, it did start me thinking, so how could sociologists use design research methods to uh, go in interesting directions with their own research? So after doing a fair amount of reading in design anthropology, I sort of thought to myself, well, I guess, well, what, what, how, how might we draw a distinction between design anthropology and design sociology? Well, the, again, of course, anthropology and sociology are very much intertwined. Um, there's a lot of overlap between the two, but of course, that tends to be more of an ethnographic approach, traditionally in anthropology, whereas ethnography is but one of many different approaches that sociologists take. So I guess that's one key difference. Um, but in many cases, it is hard to draw a distinction between what anthropologists do and what sociologists do. But sociologists have historically also focused on social groups and social institutions and social forces in their research. And are often very much about power differentials when they're doing research and identifying how certain social groups might be disadvantaged or, um, or advantaged by the, the sorts of power relationships that there are in, in, in particular societies. Um, the, the people I have come across who have taken up um, sociological research with design researchers have been mostly based at Goldsmiths College in London, including my colleague Mike Michael, who is a, an STS scholar. And he worked for a while at Sydney University when I was there, so we have done a little bit of research trying to bring together design methods with sociology, but he has also previously worked with um, designers like Bill Gaver at Goldsmiths, so he's had a very close relationship with design researchers himself, whereas I haven't really, so I've sort of tried to build on Mike's experiences to build my own research sort of strategy. I should mention that with my new appointment at the University of New South Wales, which is very new, I've only been there for about a month and a half, um, but I've had the opportunity to build my own lab, which I call the Vitalities Lab. So this is a sort of chance to just explain, I guess, what I'm trying to do with my Vitalities Lab which does include um, a focus on innovative social research methods, including design-based and arts-based methods in the lab. And I chose the term vitalities because that is a gesture to the idea of lively methods, which is a term that is used in sociology to talk about new and exciting and creative ways of doing sociological research. So I wanted to sort of give a, give a nod to lively methods, of which design-based methods, for me, are one of those. I also wanted to 
uh, give a nod to lively topics. So for me, what keeps me interested as a sociologist is thinking about new things to research. I don't like to get stuck in the same old groove and researching the same old things, so I really like to experiment with going to new directions. So that might mean looking at new digital technologies, for example. There's always something new coming out. It's always great to be able to think about ways of researching it. So um, I'm researching digital health technologies a lot in the lab. I'm researching how people live with and through their digital data. That's a big key interest of mine as well. But I'm also interested in digital food cultures. That's something that I've been writing a, a bit about lately. So analysing things like food-related apps, food-related platforms, and the kinds of representations of food that appear in those um, digital media and also how people engage with those media. So I recently wrote an article, for example, about um, extreme food representations on YouTube and talked about um, the way that excessive eating is represented in two genres of um, extreme eating and what that tells us about the gendered notion of extreme eating. So there's this um, channel called Epic Meal Time. I don't know if anyone's come across it, but it's a very dude-oriented Canadian men representation of excessive food where they literally throw junk food together and there's always plenty of lashings of bacon and Jack Daniels involved. Um, and the whole video is about just some extreme meal that they put together and then they pretend to eat it at the end, but they don't really. And I compared that with a um, Fitzbo inspirator, uh, also a North American woman, who most, most of her genre of her videos is about you know, workout routines and the right kinds of foods that one should eat to get the ideal Fitzbo body. But she has her cheat day uh, video as well here and there. And what she does in her cheat day video, she goes around and she consumes a whole lot of junk food. And it's very much about the transgressive nature. And you know, the next day she weighs herself and she hasn't changed a bit. Anyway, it, lots of interesting things to say there about the kinds of digital food cultures. So what I, what I and the other aspect of the Vitalities Lab is I'm drawing a lot on vital materialism as a theoretical underpinning. And so in that that account of those two extreme food videos, I talk about the, um, the visceralities of the effective forces that are generated with and through those kinds of digital media representations. So just to get on to design-based methods, um, I think that one really interesting way to get at those visceral, those effective, those more than representational, those multi-sensory responses that people have to, to whatever phenomena it is that you are interested in researching is to use design and arts-based methods. Um, and so I've been experimenting with various forms of, of those kinds of methods, which are, which are quite different from your average sociological technique of doing research, which does tend to involve questionnaires or face-to-face uh, -face interviews or focus group discussions. Those are the sort of the three key ways of doing research in sociology, right? Um, where I see the possibilities um, of design-based research is that it's, it's sort of engaging people in different ways of creating, of sort of co-creating research together, um, using some of the techniques that designers use to stimulate their thinking, to stimulate their creative responses, to get them thinking about the imaginaries that are invested in particular objects and things and spaces. Um, and this gets again to the, back to the vitalities, the vitalities that are generated with and through objects that people engage with. Um, that really is something I want to sort of think more about and do more with in, in the research that I'm doing. So uh, basically if I'm going to define design sociology, I'd say it builds on uh, what design anthropology has already achieved and is already doing. Um, in some ways, it, you know, it, what's been done so far fits into speculative design-based research, so the type of thing that Bill Gaver has done, for example, and, and Mike Michael has done with him. Um, also, some of the agonistic research that some um, design anthropologists engage in, which very much is about looking at the political nature of people's engagements with things um, and how they might imagine alternative futures for those things that are um, less oppressive, for example, and, and allow them to resist certain power structures that they're experiencing in their everyday lives. Um, but when it comes to actual methods, I think the idea of cultural probes, for example, I find that, the, that notion of cultural probes to stimulate people into thinking otherwise and to imagining futures to be a really productive one. 
Um, and even things like, you know, the sort of arts-based or creative writing-based methods, uh, using inspiration cards to get them to, to think about how they're experiencing certain um, objects and, and spaces, um, storyboarding, collaging, all those sorts of things are things that I have either um, experimented with in my own research or plan to. Um, so just to talk a bit more about the theoretical perspective. So as I said in the Vitalities Lab, I'm bringing in vital materialism and when I use that term, I'm referring to feminist new materialist thinkers such as Barad Braidotti, Jane Bennett and Donna Haraway. But, but another sort of group of theorists that I have been engaging with more recently which really complement what they've been trying to, to do when they talk about the way that um, capacities are distributed between humans and non-humans, which is very much a central tenet of vital materialism, is look at indigenous uh, cosmologies because many um, First Nation and Indigenous cosmologies have already, for millennia, um, had that <coughs> vital materialist theoretical perspective, this idea that humans are always more than human, uh, that, they're, that they're always part of the spatial and the uh, living and non-living environments and things with which they interact. And very much um, in relation to, particularly to nature, what we might uh, describe as natural environments. So not just living objects in a natural environment, but things like water and stones and those kinds of aspects of place are very important in indigenous cosmologies. And in fact, recently vital materialist thinkers such as uh, Braidotti and Bennett have been criticised for not acknowledging that indigenous material um, cosmologies have talked about this for a very long time. So what I'm trying to do is, um, you know, myself acknowledging the role of that kind of um, philosophy as well. So this idea that we are, that as humans, when we engage with things and spaces and places and human, hum, other humans and non-humans, we are always part of assemblages and we move through this, you know, mobility aspect to that we're constantly moving through and with uh, and forming new assemblages as we move through our everyday lives. So again, I wanted to bring in design-based methods to kind of look at that in more detail. So for example, the idea of mapping uh, is and an actually drawing maps of um, the way that humans interact with non-humans. I think having a more than human mapping exercise where you not only acknowledge, when you ask people say to, to draw a map of say the digital health technologies that they engage with, which I have done in a, in a workshop, um, but to really emphasise that we're interested in not just the human engagements with technologies, but we also want to see how the whole landscape um, is constructed with and through humans with other humans as well as with non-human technologies such as digital health technologies like apps, platforms, um, wearable devices and so on. So this idea of the more than human map is something that I'm really trying to push in my own research using uh, design-based methods. Um, this idea too of affordances is something I, that I've been thinking about. So in media studies, the notion of affordance is the designed intention of a thing or a service. Uh, what the designers wanted users to do with that thing. Um, I'm trying to think about how human bodies, the affordances of human bodies, come together with the affordances of technologies. So our human bodies, um, have certain affordances that are enfleshed and sensory. Our memories, our sen you know, our different um, senses, uh, our visceral feelings, these all come together with digital technologies in certain ways that, in ways that may enhance the fleshly capacities of bodies or even close them off or shut them down in some ways. So for example, in research I've done with people using digital health technologies, because it gets back to the design based aspect, um, apps that might be designed for calorie counting can be very difficult for people with chronic pain conditions to use. They may want to lose weight because they, they experience a lot of sort of pain in their back or their hips and to lose a bit of weight will, might, might help them with that chronic pain problem. But because they're also dealing with chronic pain, say in their joints and their hands, uh, and apps for calorie counting often involve a lot of manual input, uh, those apps weren't designed for that kind of user. 
I've also talked to women with babies, for example, who used to love their Fitbit uh, before they had their baby, but now that they're living the life of a new mother with their baby totally ruling their lives, um, and they're sleep deprived and they don't have any time to do any exercise, there's no way they want to go anywhere near their Fitbit because they know their Fitbit will start to make them feel bad and guilty and will nag them and tell them they're not getting enough steps and that they're sleep deprived, which they know already. So that, that raises the issues of, 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 of who, what, you know, what kind of body, what kind of person, what kind of lifestyle are uh, apps and wearable devices designed for. And often they're not designed with those kinds of people in mind. And so that's the kind of thing uh, that I really want to spend a lot more time looking at. Um, so I now will, just in the few minutes I have left before questions, um, so I want to talk about a project I did with Mike Michael, um, the sociologist who has done some design sociology, and talk about uh, one that's coming up soon. So in a project where we ask people to um, think about how their data are generated about them, digital data are generated, but non-digital as well, we, we used groups to do a mapping exercise where we did a time, asked groups to, to construct a time scale of an average person as they move through a 24-hour period and to write on the time frame um, at what points in the day somebody might be monitored by and data generated about them, whether it's digital or non-digital forms of data. For example, diary writing in a, in a diary is a non-digital form, but of course there are many other ways that people are monitored these days with digital forms of surveillance. Um, we also had an exercise with them where we got them, and this gets to the futures thing, we got them to imagine what we called a personal digital device uh, and also a device to collect digital data about somebody else in their lives. And that was a really interesting experience because it was getting them to think about a kind of imaginary technology, something that would work to collect, usefully collect information about themselves but also collect information about someone else in their lives and the kinds of imaginaries that were generated through those, uh, that exercise were interesting um, because it did show the ambivalence that people have about data valence, about being trapped by devices. Also, you know, the good, the pros and the negatives, the fact that they actually do want customised, personalised tracking devices which would be useful for their own purposes. And in fact, they wouldn't mind them for other people as well sometimes. So, you know, devices to check that your child is doing their homework, for example, was one that somebody thought of. Um, a device, that, an app that could compare your partner's dreams with your dreams to see if you were compatible. Um, an app that could track the phone calls your partner made, just in case they were making one too many phone calls to one particular number. So um, it does show that, you know, people can, we talked about the ambivalence and seductions of data valence in something we wrote out of that. It does show the sort of, um, yeah, those kind of ambivalence that people have, but also how they might enjoy the idea of not only being able to monitor themselves, but also monitor other people in their lives. Um, and in a, a workshop that I'm running in Sydney in October, it's called Reimagining Personal Data. And I'm going to be experimenting with lots of different ways, hands-on ways for people to, again, imagine how their personal data are part of their lives today, but also where they see the future of their data. Um, and so we'll be, we'll be doing things like um, writing a love letter or a breakup letter to their data. And that is a, um, an activity I got from, from, a, from a manual, Universal Methods of Design, I think it's called. That's what it's called. Anyway, it just lists lots of really interesting design-based methods. Um, and uh, I've experimented that in a master class, and it, I seems it really gets people's creative juices flowing, I find. Um, and we're going to think about how to best preserve your data, ask people to imagine a device for, for preserving their data into the future. We're going to get them to write data obituaries. So if you were to write um, uh, an obituary to your, the data profile that is generated on and about you, um, you know, what would you miss about that? Um, so that gets people to imagine how valuable their data might be to them. 
we're going to get them to make data journeys. So to imagine um, if, if your data are generated about you at one particular part, uh, point in your life, where will it go from there? And um, there's, there's, a, there's a, um, a lab called the Imaginaries Lab um, that's at... Who knows where the Imaginaries Lab is? It's Carnegie, Carnegie, Robert Carnegie um, University in the US. And uh, there's a really interesting um, uh, activity that they do, which is getting people to imagine new metaphors. I don't know if any of you have seen this, but it's, there's metaphor cards. And so there's actually images that, are, that, are, that they've made. And then they get people to bring together the image card and to make, think of a new metaphor using that image card. And I'm, so we're going to be experimenting with doing that, with um, getting people to generate new metaphors about data. So I think that could be a really interesting thing to do. So, okay, so I've got nine minutes left and we should probably have some Q&A now. Thank you very much. <laughs>